This is Pete Moore on Halo Talks NYC. I am here with Dennis Remorka, Remorka Fitness, three locations in Manhattan. We're going to talk about being an entrepreneur, having your passion turn into a profession, and some of the truths of running a small business, the pros and the cons and the highs and the lows, which we've all been on, but maybe people need to hear it before they start up a new business plan and leave your day job. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, sir. I really appreciate it and flattered to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So I know you went to SUNY Albany, but take us further back and uh, and, and how you got uh, how you got started and what kind of sports you did as a kid and kind of lead up to this, uh, to, to your own business. So interesting enough, initially I wanted to be the first Filipino NBA basketball player. As you can all Don't see, give up hope, man. It didn't work out. <laughs> I had, uh, I had my, my, my cousin, my, actually not my cousin-in-law, had saw me hanging from a basketball rim trying to make my, myself taller. That's what Jeremy Lin did. Yeah, it worked Gave for him. Gave like an extra like four <laughs> inches. So yeah, sort of documentary. And uh, at the time, he, uh, he was a huge bodybuilding uh, classic fanatic. And, you know, he was uh, actually New York City teacher, science teacher of the year numerous times. But he had uh, came up to me. He's like, hey, you have the making of, of a classic physique. And he's like, did you ever think about, you know, what you can do. And I was like, no, you know, and I, at the time I was buying like flex magazines, the same magazine 30 times over, bigger yeah, arms. All the weeder. Of course. Of course. Nutrition, all that. Yep. I loved it. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, I realized and he imparted one thing. He's like, um, there's only one thing that's in your control in this world. And it's, it's not even truly in your control. It's how you treat your body and what you put in it. Mm-hmm. And he's like, just picture it as a, a piece of clay and you're the sculptor. And that maybe it was like 14, 15 caught me. And then, uh, we went from there. And then, uh, so, so you, were you, would you become like a, a bodybuilder back in the day? Uh, I thought it was, uh, okay. I was a bodybuilder who had his mom drop him off the gym and okay. pick him up. And you, had a, <laughs> but, and you uh, had a big mirror and you had voices course, in your head. Of course. All right. Of course. So you were a bodybuilder then. But, uh, yeah, no, so my background is in, I was a martial artist. Okay. I wrestled back in high school cause I didn't make the basketball team. Okay. Uh, and I played tennis, but yeah. And so always, always in love with the human physique. Also just, you know, you lift the weight. You build muscle. You may mm-hmm. hurt yourself in the process, but you'll still, build, you'll still build muscle. So it's kind of cool. Gotcha. So you went to SUNY Albany, and then did, did you start taking classes related to, uh, to, to physiology, or did you do something completely different? Absolutely not. I said, <laughs> <laughs> SUNY Albany is a, is a fantastic uh, university. I actually uh, went to psychology and uh, criminal justice. And then, you know, at the time, it was what my, my uh, academic advisor said I was closest to. In terms of a, of a degree, so I went with that. Okay. But um, my whole family, for, for everyone's in either, I'm the first generation, uh, Filipino. So either nursing, doctors, lawyers, engineer, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, afterwards, I had planned on going to uh, nursing school at Beth Israel okay. after I came out of school. And so uh, left Albany, moved down to the city, um, decided I wanted to be try my hand at nursing, because it was with the, the classic archetype, what a good Filipino would do. Mm-hmm. And uh, in order to pay for that, at the, at the which is now defunct, which is the Beth Israel Nursing School, uh, I signed up at, at Equinox initially at 85th and 3rd as a personal trainer. Okay. Yeah. And, and then, you got, you, did, you, did they train you there or did you take a course and then? Uh... Oh, uh, you know, they, at the time, it was before they had any um, teaching tools in place. And there was a great staff, but there was no educational process. So I was a, a meathead at the time. I was powerlifting. Okay. And then, uh, so you looked the part. I, I looked like a, I was definitely, I looked big. Okay. <laughs> I was like 270. Wow. And, uh, yeah, big boy. But uh, I, I wasn't, uh, I wanted to find somebody to learn from. And so um, I was one of the worst performing trainers, sales trainers at Equinox. Hmm. And uh, I realized this because it wasn't, I, I if people don't want to train with me, it was, I, I can't sell if, you know, it's also walking, walking the floor. So I, I was looking for a place where I can sink my teeth in and also learn from the best. And that's how I came across definitions. Gary Steinhardt and Joe Barron. Gotcha. Yeah. So that, that was more, that's more of a, um, like a, a private personal training studio. Yeah. And so, you know, when I, when I searched it, I was looking for the, the, top personal training studio, but also the, the one that's endured the longest. They, they were one of the first, I believe in 1983. Mm-hmm. They started off actually here in the Flatiron. And then uh, I was looking for somebody who I could learn from. And I was hungry. I was hungry. And uh, just for education. Yeah. Those guys always did a great job of marketing. I remember they used to market in all of the... Uh 
the uh, taxis. taxis. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was a great. I don't know how much they paid for that, but it was totally like nice. Yeah, everybody not- knew about it. So it was pretty awesome. So how long did you stay there? I was actually the I was the head trainer at the 78th and Madison location for around four years. Okay. You know, it was a great environment. It was a great team camaraderie. There wasn't any um, competitive aspect between the trainers because the clients were given to you. Okay. Uh, and also exposed me to uh, a different type of client also, uh, which also in turn helped make me, uh, essentially made me a more uh, cultured person as well as well-rounded trainer. Yeah. So it's the, the upper echelon of, of New York City's elite. And then what prompted you to uh, start your own business? You know what? It was, it was at a point where I was at a, I would either had to leave my job as a trainer to do the nursing rotations, right? Okay. And so it would have meant um, quitting my job, doing that full time. And then uh, I, I, it came, I, I realized I didn't want to, something wasn't right in my gut. It wasn't mm-hmm. right. And to all credit to all nurses, it's the world turns because of those people. Right. But it wasn't for me. And so I said, you know what? Screw it. I'll give it a year. And it was March 19th, I think, 2008, 2009. And I said, I'll give it a year. I'll mm-hmm. see what I can do. If, uh, if I can't make anything of it, uh, then I'll, I'll go back and finish it. And I'll just, but I, I, had a, I didn't want to have any regrets. And so I did that. I left all my clients. I, I bowed out gracefully with my old bosses, who I'm still in great terms with. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, you know what? I'm going to go off and be an independent trainer. And I'm like, you know, I'd love to grow the company, but I don't think there's any room for me. And then, uh, ironically enough, my, one, of, one of the bosses said, you know, he doesn't think I would make it, but there's always a place here at the table if I ever want to come back. So I left all my clients with the exception of two that came with, and then I rented space at another gym close by, and I started my own company. And then six months later, with mattress save money and uh, $19,000 worth of financing, I opened up my first gym in illegally, I don't recommend it, in a brownstone on uh, 75th and Park. Okay. When you say illegally, just no noise uh, 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 disturbance issues? Yeah, you know. Well, like, in was, a, like in a uh, dining room area? It was, you know, it was, I rented a floor through of a brownstone, which was, which the landlord knew. Okay. But um, it wasn't, obviously, it didn't have the proper CFO. Well, you're uh, not alone with that, trust yeah, me. The yeah. funny guys every, that have retail every locations building, yeah. don't have a CFO. Every, every business <laughs> in New York City is, is illegally zoned. But yeah. uh, So I, I did that. And then I uh, started off, floored through the brownstone, and then that's where the dream started. And then when did you feel the itch or like in your gut that, okay, okay, I'm ready to take the next step and sign a lease and kind of put your name on the line? It wasn't, you know, it wasn't until I realized that I was at, I had a, I had a bucket list by the time I was 30, 35, and 40. Uh, the one at 30, you know, 30 was, I wanted to have a Shih Tzu and a French Bulldog got that. Okay. Uh, I wanted to have uh, a Mini Cooper. I got that. I also wanted to have my first gym. And so that was the first bucket list. And so I got, got those out. The, the, the second one didn't exactly make it when I hit 35. I wanted a, a stoop. I wanted a brownstone. Not so much for the brownstone, but for the stoop. For the, like stoop ball or to hang out on You could on just it? sit outside, drink your coffee. Okay. Just, just watch. And you had to own it. You couldn't just like, yeah, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't want to loiter. Okay. 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 But, uh, yeah, so I, I would do that. And then, you know, after that, I, I had, realize that, well, you know, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? I don't view things as, some people view things as trophies, right? Um, if for me, it's like a, a notch and trying to figure out what's next. So it's like, um, I realize that action prevents anxiety. And so if I feel like, if I have this gut instinct and I feel like um, it's worth taking, I'm all for it. I'll go all, all in. Uh, never, never. Action really. prevents anxiety? anxiety? Yeah. Interesting. Especially for, for somebody who's, um, I'm a very emotional person, and so that's, I have a, a relatively high EQ working with people. I love working with people, mm-hmm. but I also have to keep myself in check. So the, that's where the logic steps in. And so that's, you know, fortunately enough, one of the biggest benefits of working out, it affords you that cathartic state where you can reflect, step away from it, and mm-hmm. then re-engage with uh, proper logic. And I realized, you know, after any time anything came about, any opportunities, I would do the same thing. I have the same protocol, I'd work out, crush it come back and then get a cup of coffee and then brainstorm. Okay. But, uh, yeah. And so and I got the itch, I got the itch. And then I had wanted to, uh, at the time back in 2011, I wanted to break into the small group fitness. And, uh, at the time 
I was trying to find a different way to go about things. And so I contacted Polar, and then that's when they first launched their Cardio GX, right. their system. And so um, it was Orange Theory, the Ravens, and us were the ones using it. The Falcons, rather, Falcons. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I wanted to build a whole training protocol around that. Okay. And so we had like three Versa climbers. It was a full high intensity interval training class with the heart rate monitors. But and they have the boards up and everything yeah, so you can yeah, track this, your boards. Yeah. Rudimentary back in 2011 before the whole My Zone came out and everything. Right. But um, yeah, rudimentary eight years ago. <laughs> a short eight years ago of rudimentary <laughs> but, uh, version two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, then that's when I broke in. That's the, the first expansion. Uh, and I realized that, you know, finding out where my, my whole model is finding out where one, where the money is, mm-hmm. your primary pull is within four blocks of your, your, your epicenter. Right. And so everything's convenience based. And so with that, I just plotted out my map where I wanted to be. And so that's when I went from 74th, then to 64th in Madison. And then, yeah. So did you bring in any partners or is this a, a sole proprietor? It was a sole proprietor. Sure. You know, I had uh, the partners I have are people that I, that I want to grow with mm-hmm. who make manage the location or, you know, key, uh, key cogs in, in, in the engine that help us, help us run. So. And how much of this, uh, when you went back and said, okay, I've accomplished this, I've accomplished that. Um, when your, your parents wanted you to, to maybe have a nursing degree or mm-hmm. have something more, you know, professional, like, you know, when I was an entrepreneur for a while, which I still am, you know, my mom would be like, you know, what, what am I, what do I tell people that you are? Like, <laughs> what, like how do I define that? Like my kids are like somewhat success or not. How'd that go? Uh, you know, it wasn't until recently, like I'd say maybe been in business for like eight years. My parents finally realized that there's something there. Oh, ironically okay. enough. Uh, it was, so it was you had to defend it, for, defend it for a period of time? No, no, no. They were, they were supportive, but they really, they had no clue. They had right. no clue. Cause I mean, let's be honest. Uh, this business plan or this business model you, you put in any other city in New York, any other, it doesn't work. Right. You know, it's, it's all contingent on the density and the demographic and also the average household. Can they afford it? Mm-hmm. Right. And so, I mean, that's what, you know, we've been around since 08. We didn't feel, you know, when the, the market crashed, this is certain, if anything, the business increased because of people needing you know, stress relief right. or, or helping that. But yeah, parents had no idea. So, so when you look back now at, at the, or you reset the bucket list, you know, how do you calibrate, or uh, what do you want to do personally versus what somebody who might be an investor or somebody who wants to help you grow, you know, how do you kind of calibrate? Like, this is what my gut says and this is what I want to do mm-hmm. versus like, you know, do I need to have like 50 locations? Like, how do you think about it? Cause what my, and my point is that, there are a lot of entrepreneurs that come in and say, Hey, I want, you know, I've done well in, you know, I've got 10 locations in St. Louis with some concept and I want to go and take it in private equity. And I want to go to Kansas city in Chicago. And it's mm-hmm. like, well, you want to do that because you've heard that that's what you think you should do. But mm-hmm. you know, this is your business. You don't have any partners, you know, you can go, you can come whenever you want. You can leave whenever you want. You know, you don't have anyone to answer to except yourself. Mm-hmm. So it's a completely different mindset when you want to go and, and take it to the next level. If you want to take in equity or take in other partners or take on more personal debt or risk. Mm -hmm. So how do you think about where you're at, which is having a nice successful business that you could be at each one of three locations, whatever you want versus, you know, aspirations for being, you know, take this model and and replicate it, you know, whether it's even outside uh, the island of Manhattan or whether it's, you know, larger, or do you say, Hey, look, I've got my footprint. I'm I'm making my mark. Like I'm good. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, that's a very good question. And it wasn't until recently that I kind of had the epiphany. You know, I've, I know we have, along with the personal training, you know, uh, business we have, I also do a full design. We do full construction, uh, of gym design construction for the vertical market for residences. And, you know, that's also, I love design. So everything, uh, all the facilities are designed, built myself okay. with uh, my, my staff. And uh, it's been great. And it's also, it's nice because you create a, it's blank canvas, just like your body, you know, that creative aspect. And so I was kind of, I was floating along. I, I really didn't have any, I was kind of, the businesses were doing good. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But then uh, I realized at three, it wasn't until recently where somebody said, you know, one of my, uh, one of my trainers was asking about um, a position, director, a director of uh, operations. And she brought it to my attention that, you know, we're at three locations, we're not, uh, 
a mom, technically a mom and pop anymore, right? Mm-hmm. We need to have some kind of corporate structure, uh, infrastructure. And so it, it wasn't until then where I realized that, you know, I have, I've, my, my best, uh, people give me the best advice are my closest friends and clients, right? Mm-hmm. And all, of, all of which are successful and I never impose on them. They're always the ones embarking these little, little uh, pieces of knowledge and, uh, you know, in, in what you just said with the private equity, with like, you know, once you hit essentially like 10 clubs, that's when your valuation skyrockets. It's just a matter of what do you want to do with that. Uh, I, I realized that at three, where I am now, I could easily just be comfortable and do what we're doing. Uh, I think that the market itself has changed so much since, since we've been around, since, we, since the conception of the uh, inception of the business. I think... One thing, especially where the market goes towards everything being automated through uh, either an app or, you know, people crave human interaction at the, at, mm-hmm. the, at, the, at the most. You go through, you walk through a busy city block, you walk past 50 people, none of which will, will smile or, or say hi, right? And so it's a very, Most very, of them have their head down anyway, right? Of, of course, of course. <laughs> Unfortunately. But when somebody does say hi to you, you remember it and it can change your day. Right. Sure. And yeah. so that's yeah. that's why we think of that. Hey, we use this halo effect, like just pass down, some be kind, or tell me about a workout that you're doing, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. the keto thing I'm working on right now. Just kind of pass those things on, and it did did dominoes to, yeah, to it's everybody. A great, it's great yeah. ethos. It's, and so that's that's. And I realized that I would like to you know stick to what works, which is high level customer service. Mm-hmm great soft skills, actually caring about the people and providing results. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's kind of what we're known for. We, we're not, we don't, you know, we're not, nothing we do is, is revolutionary. Uh, but what we do do is every time somebody leaves, they leave with a smile mm-hmm. and create an atmosphere where they, they don't want to leave. You come in, everybody knows your name, everybody knows your kid's name. Mm-hmm. It's a, a tight group of, of clients and trainers. And it feels like, you know, it feels like a, a home. And so I wanted to replicate that along the city. And so we're actually, I recently started working with a consultant um, who's a good friend, this guy, Mark Cohen, who's helped in shaping the um, possible expansion or market fitness yeah, for the next I know. Two, two to three years. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to be scaling up. We're going to be scaling up to okay. six to eight clubs. Well, there was, um, well, two things. One, uh, there was a client I saw and he had in his uh, culture page. Mm-hmm. It had MMFI make me feel important it's mm-hmm. like that's what if you're the front desk worker like that's the one thing that you're responsible for is that every client that comes in here every member that comes in just make them feel important yeah know their name and that kind of just like sets off a different vibe when they get into the club 100%. because you know they're there to work out which is not you know to take a nap mm-hmm. <laughs> like you got to get ready to work out so uh-huh. you better like enter it with a positive component to it that you can bring to it so i agree with you on that um, so, so as you grow, are you thinking, of, you know, what are you thinking about related to having other people on the team and how you're going to help manage that, you know, and maybe give up some of the centralized nature of who you've got working for you and say, okay, look, I'm going to pick people that understand how I operate and I'm going to move them in and they're going to, they're going to be, you know, on the front lines. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, or currently like how I, how I open and how I operate, uh, you know, I, so I'm at primarily at my 64th and Madison location, okay. uh, 74th street and 17th street, uh, run independently from me because of the people I've entrusted to, uh, you know, operate it. And so that's, uh, we'd be essentially, um, creating a similar, not so much replicating myself, but having people with the similar experience, similar bedside manners, and also a great heart and scaling it that way. Now, uh, It'd all be contingent on the, the location. We're still uh, weeding out which are the, the primes most underserved. But uh, so we would, we would do that way. And then we do, you know, GM staff as well as, uh, but it, as long as they're in line with the, the ethos and the culture of the company. Gotcha. And so you've got members that are on a monthly, are they on uh, packages? How, how's your business model set up? Super simple. You know, we keep, I believe we keep it simple, keep it stupid. So we have, uh, we do, Private one-on-one. Um, people can have access to the facility to use cardio equipment if they have a personal training package. We're personal training only, and so uh, there's no monthly membership. Mm-hmm. There's no uh, like annual dues, uh, especially with where you feel like you're you're being pickpocketed by everybody. I, I really feel like it's key just keep it as simple as possible so clients can focus on the experience as opposed to 
what's coming out of their wallet. Mm-hmm. And you're doing group programming as well? No, no, no. You know, All we, 100%, I, 101. Yeah, 101. Um, and so we have the model we're, we're moving forward with. At my 74th Street location, I brought in uh, an internist. So we, have, uh, we built out a whole medical wing where we have a physical therapist, a primary care, mm-hmm. as well as our, training, uh, our personal training facility. And so I wanted to, it's called Remorka Wellness. That's going to be the, the first of our, you know, the, the, the model we're going to step forward with, where we want everything to be, you know, especially in industries so convoluted, like wellness in general, like it's, uh, you know, we want, you know, people feel like they're, they lack that, that client interaction or also being taken care of, you know, people, you know, want to be, uh, even if it's going to a doctor, they'll just say, write your script, find you another doctor for, mm-hmm. or, or for if you need an orthopedist. What we do is we'll intake, we'll assess, have the PTs look at you, um, the doctor, and then uh, we'll go from there. So they can, everything is quarterbacked, or if you're directed, you're, you're guided. So there's always a line of communication between all the medical professionals uh, as well as ourselves. Gotcha. All right, and in closing, what kind of, uh, what are some of the quotes that, that, uh, that either you live by or that you know, people hear coming out of your mouth, whether they're employees or members, what, 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 do, you, what do you frequently say? Uh, well, first, definitely the action prevents anxiety. You know, if, you, if you're, you can, it's like a fork in the road. You can either act on it or you can dwell on it and, and mm-hmm. worry about what could have been. You know, that's, that's definitely the first. Uh, old friend of mine who's uh, recently passed, this guy Martin Stevens, who used to be the uh, creative director of Revlon. I don't know if you remember the Charlie commercial back in the day. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So he was, the, he was the guy who created it. And so he was, his whole concept was, Acting on the, uh, it's, it's funny, it's when uh, birth control came out for women, so the women's rights movement. And then he wanted to, you know, empower a woman coming into the bar, waving off all these guys wearing pants and, uh, and power shoulders and being independent. And he, uh, you know, that was, that was his big thing towards me. And especially like, you know, walk before you run. Mm-hmm. I always wanted to do these things. It's like, Dennis, walk before you run. Mm-hmm. It's like, you're not even a gym yet. You're not even a business yet. You know, you think you are because you have your own LLC. But until you're <laughs> brick and mortar, you're not a business, right? Yeah. And then, Good point. and then the action prevents anxiety. And so those are things I, I, I definitely live by. You know? Great. All right, we're going to add those to our, uh, our Halo uh, top quotes list with uh, Gannelin over here. So in closing, um, if anyone's looking for a shooting guard, Filipino, <laughs> Dennis, R- Dennis Remorka, still undrafted. Just don't have me dribble the ball. All right. So from the studio to results to getting rid of anxiety by taking action first. I like it. I'm going to start using that one, and I'll quote you on it. Thanks for being on the Halo Talks. Look forward to checking out your locations and uh, being uh, being updated on uh, on the next phase of growth. My pleasure, man. Thank Thanks, you very man. much for having me. Great to see you.